We are in John chapter 12. Just a few verses today, 12 through 19. I've called this message Triumphant Peace. Triumphant Peace. I want to start off by saying this is not Palm Sunday. Just so you know that up front. This is the text we use on Palm Sunday. We have, you know, the kids with the palm fronds come in waving them with all the all the cool things on Palm Sunday, but this is not Palm Sunday. This is the text we're using today. Why? Because it's what is next in the book of John. And we're going through John, as we all know, and we are entering the fall part of the year and not the spring, so don't be confused. It's September. It's not April. So with that being said, let's pray. Father, we come to you today loving you and praising you as we enter into this time of the spoken word. Father, just speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Okay? Now, you remember when we talked about Mary anointing Jesus with expensive nard and expensive perfume? And we talked about it being on, on Saturday evening. We talked about the fact that Jewish Sabbath, there could be no work done. And since Mary was in the kitchen, we know it was after sundown, Saturday. The Sabbath was sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So we know it was after sundown. Martha was cooking, Mary anointing Jesus. And, and so now John says the next day. So we can take this as being Sunday, right? First day of the week. It says the large crowd had come to the feast. Some of the people would be the ones that saw Jesus bring Lazarus back from the grave. Saw Lazarus come out of the tomb. Some would be the ones that heard about it. Some would be the ones who were there and saw Lazarus and Jesus together. Okay? But John says it was a large crowd. So let's get this picture of what a large crowd looks like. In your mind, what does a large crowd look like? Church is full. It's a large crowd, right? Okay. Or you go to a major sporting event and the stadium's full. Large crowd. Large crowd. Okay. The historian Josephus says there could have been as many as two and a half million people in Jerusalem. Okay? It's before the temple was destroyed, and it is Passover. That's one of the major events, one of the major festivities. It's Passover. It is Passover. Now, Josephus may have exaggerated some. We don't know for sure. We do know the historian Jeremiah estimates that there was at least 100,000 people Easily, who participated in Passover. Now, we've been to the city of Jerusalem. The old city, they call it. Right? The city now is huge. The old city is where the walls are inside. It's an old city. Now, there probably was some housing outside. We don't know for sure at the time. But 100,000? Yeah, they can fit there pretty. Two and a half million? Oh, it would have been like, no, I'm trying to get through. Because it's narrow streets. I mean, two and a half million people. It would have been a massive crowd, which, when you think about the events that took place after this, when Jesus was brought on trial and all the crowds were shouting and <coughs> leading him through the streets, it would have been a massive crowd for all this. So, go between 100,000 and two and a half million, it's probably closer to the millions mark. Okay. It was a massive crowd. It would have been a very large crowd. So when John says a large crowd, we can safely say it was a large crowd. Verses 13 through 15. 
So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, as we know from all the Palm Sundays we've lived through, and you go through the different Gospels, Okay, Jesus sent his disciples to get the donkey and his colt. And they do. He said, if they ask you, what are you doing? Say, the master has need of it. He did that. But their cloaks on the, on the colt had never been ridden before. And he didn't get thrown off. That had been embarrassing. He didn't get thrown. And he rode the colt. And the people were shouting, and they're putting their cloaks down there, waving the palm branches. And shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, even the King of Israel, Hosanna. They're just going on and on. Okay. The basic storyline is this. Jesus finds a young donkey and rides with the people, meet him with palm branches, they cheer him, praise him, and acclaim him. That's the baseline. Let's look deeper. Palm fronds were symbols of welcome for Jewish heroes returning from battle or at unusual periods of rejoicing. A bit of history. Okay? The crowd here obviously came out to meet a hero. They're shouting their hosannas and they're proclaiming a blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, namely the King of Israel. The expression, he who comes, is a familiar designation for the expectation of the coming Messiah. For the coming Messiah. And the initiation of the Messianic, of the Messianic age. Okay? He who comes. So they're saying the Messiah is coming. And they really had no idea what they were really saying. Because it was the coming of the Messianic age. I mean, Jesus was the one who healed the people who made the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dumb speak, and the dead come back to life. Not just Lazarus. You read all four Gospels, there's many ones that he brought back from the dead, although Lazarus was dead four days. That's why he was so important, because too late, couldn't bring him back to life. Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. Jesus was the one who was doing these things. Man, people who couldn't talk, they could suddenly speak. Those who couldn't see, they were not blind anymore. Those who couldn't hear, they could hear. And those who were dead were alive. And this was Jesus. This was Jesus. Hosanna! Hosanna! The crowd attached themselves to the idea of triumph in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This literally happened before their very eyes. When Jesus chose a young donkey for his entrance rather than a chariot or horses or a camel as, as animals were used by the Romans or Eastern conquerors, he undoubtedly understood that there was another perspective to the text in Zechariah. A perspective that would not be warmly welcomed by the crowd. That perspective was what? Humility. Humility. True humility cannot be faked. This man wants to tell you how humble they are. They're bragging and they're not being humble.
Now, hidden in these, these, these boisterous calls of Hosanna, there's an ironic twist of, of immense proportions. When the crowd shouted Hosanna, which is a cry for salvation now, that's what that means, salvation now, they were begging for something far beyond anything they could have ever anticipated. In the background of their cries of Hosanna, there was a great chant from Psalms, chapter 118, particularly this Psalm 118, 25. And this part of that said, says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. This is a psalm that was used in connection with a festival of tabernacles, dedication, and Passover. Right? These are the same three feasts that John focuses on in this festival cycle we've been studying about. He's focused on these same three, and yet Psalm 118, 25, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. They would not chant these, they would sing it. They would sing it. The waving of the palm branches the shouting of Hosanna. It, it doesn't need to be missed here because there's a connection with Psalm 118, 25. Okay? As we just read, during the Feast of Tabernacles, men and boys would take branches and they would wave them. When the temple singers would reach the crescendo of Hosanna in their songs, men and the boys would start waving these branches. What a great sight that would have been. This psalm was also used in Passover, which was coming up. But the way they said, Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, was a call for salvation. Jesus said that his hour had come, but it would end on the cross and not on David's throne. If they'd only understood the implications, the messianic implications of this verse, they'd have really understood it. Psalm 118, 22, right before 25, it says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. If they had truly understood this verse, they would have understood the stone that was rejected became the head of the corner. They didn't understand. Now, there have been other processions that day. Every time a Roman leader, Pilate, or whoever else, during these festivities, they would want to ride into the city. They'd come with soldiers on foot with their shields and their swords and their spears. And they would come with riders. And they would come in a chariot or on a white horse. They would come in as a conquering hero, one returning from battle, although they weren't. They just wanted to show their might and their force and their power over the Jewish people. Look at me. I am over you. And then Jesus comes in and it begins shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, with the palm branches. They didn't wave palm branches for the others. Just for Jesus. But here he comes on a donkey's colt. Not a charging white stallion. If he had done that, that would have been a proclamation of war and Rome would have wiped him out. That's not why he didn't ride the charging white stallion. He chose a donkey's cold wine because it was a symbol of peace. It was a symbol of peace. Go to verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. How often do we read verse 16 and go, what's wrong with those guys? Why didn't they pick up on it? They're a little bit slow on the up, Really? Really? 
to say this. We can say what we want to about the disciples not understanding this, this and not seeing it until later after Jesus was glorified. That was the plan, Jesus' plan all along. But how often times in our own life do we get into the thick of things and not see the full picture until later? How often are you telling somebody something happened? Well, I would have said. Well, I would have done. Well, yeah, because you're telling them. And now they're seeing the whole picture from the outside looking in, but you're on the inside. How many times do we just not see it? Why? One word, human. So when the disciples didn't pick up on it at that moment, we wouldn't have either. We wouldn't have. I mean, like, the disciples were like, man, this whole crowd, they're just, and they're laying the coast down, and they're waving palm branches, and they're shouting all these things, and, and, and after he rose from the dead, they're like, you remember when, yeah, I remember that. Oh. Things begin to click. Okay. 17 through 19. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him to the dead continued to bear witness. They're still watching. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now the people were, they, 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 they were still following him, all right? And as it said, some of these were there when Lazarus walked out of the tomb. Some had heard about it. Some were there, they saw Jesus with Lazarus later, right? They continued to follow him because the more it was talked about, the better the story got. And it's pretty fantastic to begin with. The more it was talked, the better it got. And that's the way stories go. The more stories talked about, the better it gets. And the more we tell the story, the better we make it. Unless it's something really bad and people retell it, it's going to make it worse and worse. I've been receiving it in both of those. Sometimes at the same time. It's always fun. Right? So the story had been talked about. Some of these were there. They saw it. But it was told and retold and retold. Now the Pharisees, eh, it's a different matter. They didn't like it. They didn't like it a bit. They are the religious establishment. And they were completely frustrated about this charismatic Man, this guy's got charisma, and the people just hang on his words. And when we try to do something or say something or trip them up, he makes us look like idiots. We don't like him. We don't like him a bit. This charismatic leader, he seemed to spark a messianic-like revival and passion among the people. They didn't like him. All they could see was this Jesus crowd and they were, how they were going to ruin everything. The Romans would come in and they would, they would lose all their power and their money. So Jesus had to be stopped. They were telling each other, you are gaining nothing or this is getting us nowhere. That's what it means right there. This is getting us nowhere. In exasperation, they said the whole world has gone after him, and they felt like they were losing control, and everything was collapsing around them. Jesus, the light of the world. He is the light of the people of the world, and his coming into the world was to take away the sins of the people of the world. Not to sit on David's throne. Not to raise up a conquering army that he can bring back to life. Just 
imagine that army. How many guys lose today? 20,000. Okay, 20,000. Stand up. Couldn't be beat, right? Imagine the thoughts of the people. It's not like Jesus came. It's not why he was here. He was here to forgive the sins of the people of this world. But because of hard hearts and rejection, the coming of Jesus also meant judgment of the world. Invitation. I called this message triumphant peace. Listen to me. Listen to me. Triumphant peace. There's a reason I call it. I was talking to my wife yesterday, even last night. I said, I don't have a title for my message yet. And I got this morning, I knew what it was. Triumphant peace. Why? Why triumphant peace? Triumphant means victorious or to win. Right? Peace means reconciliation or harmony. We have triumphant peace with God. We have triumphant peace with God. We have been reconciled with Him and our sins are forgiven if we ask forgiveness. And we can live in victorious harmony with God because of what Jesus did for us. Triumphant peace is victorious harmony. It's my prayer this morning we all have triumphant peace and we live in victorious harmony. Let's pray. Father, we come to you thanking you for victorious harmony with you. When we ask for forgiveness of our sin, I thank you, I thank you that we can have this victorious peace, this triumphant harmony. We can have victory over sin and live with you in perfect peace throughout eternity. And I thank you for this. It's in Jesus' name.